Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. Fires in the Amazon. It's a frightening headline that our friends at Naked Scientists discussed in the summer, and it went viral in the mainstream media too. How did this water-rich and moist environment come to start burning up? It seems counterintuitive. Here's Rachel Comenta from the Cambridge Institute for Conservation. For many, many years and generations, traditional small-scale landholders, including indigenous communities, they use fire. It's absolutely essential because that's how they clear the land to grow their crops. But they do so with different management practices to contain a fire. And so this is why for all the generations which fire has been used, we haven't always seen these uncontrolled fires in forest landscapes. But today we have begun to see, and not just this year, but since really the 1990s, fires and mega fire events recurring throughout these landscapes because of other types of land users which have come to the region to practice soy and cattle production and other different types of agriculture and including industrial scale agriculture, which has created a very different situation where fires are now prevalent. Rachel Comenta speaking in a Naked Scientist podcast about the Amazon fires. It's difficult to see the situation improving for this unique and beautiful habitat under current Brazilian political leadership. Meanwhile, the huge Greenland ice cap is melting, the North Pole ice is thinning year on year, and the oceans are inundated with microplastics and plastic bags. What's to be done? With me to discuss this are Steph Bryant of the Faraday Institute, Dr. Freya Jeffcott of Queen's College, Cambridge, and Beth Bagava, who is a student activist at the university. Welcome, everybody. So my opening question is deliberately provocative. How much can we actually damage the environment? Should we not expect to damage the environment to a certain amount? It's intended to imply that human beings have always exploited nature, cutting down trees, growing crops, fishing, mining, and so on. Is it just a matter of degree to which we do it? Freya. Oh, well, from the public health perspective, I'm not sure how much as humans we can actually tolerate anymore. I, I think it's already, it's a, the hour is much later than we realise. Uh, pollution alone is already causing about 20% of the global deaths. I, and a lot of this is air pollution, the same kind of fossil fuels that are driving climate change. They're, they're slowly killing us. The miasmas are back in that sense. I mean, there were eggs in Ghana recently that tested for PCBs at 220 times the EU limit. And this is just e-waste. These are not things we've always had. uh, Genuinely, as like physical bodies, I'm not sure how much we can actually tolerate. So you'd have the view that we can damage the environment no more at all? I I think that the cost is already much higher than we realise. Just look at male fertility, even developed countries, as exposure to pollutions has. I mean, it's an existential threat that I don't think people are really, it isn't registering with them yet. And Beth, you're you're, you're a student activist, we can say that, can't you? You're out there trying to generate uh, not just public interest, but outrage at what's going on. Mm. What sort of things are you up to? So, I mean, I'll kind of riff off that for a little bit first before I launch into kind of what the type of campaigns I'm involved in. So I think basically a lot of the lack of urgency present public discourse about climate change comes from a focus exclusively on the global north as opposed to the global south. Um, So this perception that we've still got time left, you can see see it even in Extinction Rebellion protests. There's one in Cambridge this weekend about the blood of our children. And even aside from the kind of questionable religious undertones of that, there's the fact that actually they're projecting climate crisis forward into the next generation, whereas this is an intergenerational issue. This is something which for communities in the global south is a real existential threat already. So we had India is um, where my family originally from. Um, That's my heritage. There were cities there that ran out of water this summer. By 2030, a quarter of India will be without drinkable water. Like this is an existential threat. And Steph, in the work that you do in schools in particular, is this something that really resonates with kids or, or, you know, what's your experience in the classroom? 
Absolutely. I think young people are so aware of these issues, more so than any generation previously. They have the internet at their fingertips and they're so aware of problems going on all over the world. And not just aware, I'd say I think they have real concerns about the environment, about people, about social justice. And we've seen that in the school strikes and we've seen it in their desire to engage with these huge environmental issues. And so I think the key question for us or for me in schools is thinking, well, instead of being the older generation talking down to them and saying things like, oh, you don't really understand it or, oh, jolly good, you can be the ones to make a difference then. I think we need to think, well, how do we, the people with influence currently, help young people to shape a future where... Um, where what they dream of and the world they want to live in is a reality when at the moment they may well be facing environmental disaster. So um, in schools, I guess an aspect of what I do is encouraging young people to ask their questions, listen to their questions, and then perhaps start to support them in helping them to work out where to look for their answers, um, where to go for some support. Freya, your expertise um, is in the field of medical anthropology. And uh, I'm, I'm, I learned a new term uh, when I read your CV, zoonosis, and I think it would be good to share what that means with our listeners. But in particular, I'm intrigued by how humanity is contributing to the growth of viruses that indeed threaten us all. Oh, absolutely. So to start with zoonoses, zoonoses are the pathogens that jump from animals into humans. And actually the majority of human diseases, well, infectious diseases, come from animal sources. So what we call reservoirs. Now, the things you might have noticed that lots of large outbreaks going on at present, we've got a very big Ebola outbreak in the DRC. And I mean, we had an even larger one in West Africa just a couple of years ago. And they might seem like they're becoming larger and more frequent. And that's because they are. The things that are driving these outbreaks in greater scale and greater frequency are things like deforestation, which upsets the kind of natural ecological balance of these pathogens. We have international travel, which spreads viruses far faster. We have high density living as people move into towns and cities, so it spreads a lot easier. Essentially, everything that is globalization is driving disease emergence. And so we can't keep doing reactive responses to outbreaks. They're too slow. The cost economics is huge. The cost to human life is appalling. But it also doesn't address the underlying drivers, which is this sort of you know, it's a wholesale damnation of globalization, more or less. Let me be the pain in this room and say this is a globalized world. There is this a technology that allows people to travel. Um, and unless you're going to stop people traveling, unless you're going to stop people moving to the cities, we have to be reactive. Is that not right? So I think the first thing we have to do is we have to reframe the problem. I, again, we've got to get rid of these notions of a, a lot of bad stuff happens in low and middle income countries, but we're in some way insulated at this point in the West. Also, the idea that closing borders or being reactive with disease is any kind of meaningful response to it at all. We have to change the framing to these are not sudden, acute, unexpected events. These are inevitable incidents that come from these much larger trends, these ecological uh, these poverty driven and also, to be honest, this sort of neoliberal approach to the world and the idea that we can operate as separate states and still manage these massive threats to global health. Small, small solutions. <laughs> well, big problems, but it's going to take, is it going to be big solutions or are they going to be small steps? I think climate crisis absolutely has to be understood as systemic crisis as something which is born out of the way we structure the world we live in, um, economically specifically. I mean, I'd go further. I don't think it's just a crisis of neoliberalism. I think it's a crisis born out of and kind of intrinsic to capitalism. I think that the fact that we live within an economic system premised on constant growth and constant expansion, the drive for resource extraction, is the only real way to understand climate crisis. And we've also got to look at the colonial implications of that, which lives we value more, where the majority of that resource extraction takes place. And I think it's, all, it's quite crucial that a lot of the uh, proposed solutions to climate crisis also don't seem to consider that. So 
Green New Deal, much as I respect like, the campaigns in the US and the UK, that is still being framed around this kind of extractivist outlook. It seems in demanding a green industrial revolution in the historically privileged lands of the US and the UK, that there is a willingness to sacrifice communities in the global south, again, to extract the resources required to drive that green industrial revolution, to create the solar, solar panels that will allow the UK and the US to go fossil free. There has to be, I think, a complete reframing in the way we think about climate crisis. It has to be seen as something intrinsic to the system. It has to be seen as something neocolonial in its origin as well, or just purely colonial in its origin. And I think that is actually a healthier way for us to process it as individuals. I think a big problem with the current discourse is that it places the responsibility of climate crisis on the individual. So the whole idea of carbon footprint, which was actually developed by fossil fuel companies, it's a distraction, I think, from the real systematic problems. And it places a huge burden on like, the individual mind. Um, so what would, you, what would you like to see if there was one thing each of you would like to see happen personally, before we perhaps talk, Steph, about the kids that you meet, um, what, would it, what would it be? One practical thing, because you're talking in these big theoretical terms, you know, colonialism and the approaches to these issues. And I'm just wondering for the listeners, what practical thing would you recommend? I'm not talking to us just about the individual, but anything that would make a difference, Beth. So I think for me, it kind of begins with education. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't need to be formal schooling. It can be education through dialogue, people communicating with each other. I mean, I've interviewed um, youth strikers before and their analyses of the situation are kind of fantastically sophisticated. And that comes from engaging with the resources provided by the, the internet, kind of ready access to information about climate science and political theory as well. But I think kind of creating the spaces for those discussions to take place and kind of supporting them as much as possible is really, really crucial to developing a strong movement for systematic change and crucially a movement which understands the world it wants to create as well as the world it wants to dismantle. Yeah, I'd be really, really interested in empowering individuals, actually, not because I think that the responsibility should be placed on the individual, but I think that people should really be able to realise and recognise that at least in our society, we have a voice and we have a vote. And that vote isn't just a political vote, but it's thinking about, well, how we spend our money, what we choose to buy. Um, all of those things um, are a, a vote in some way. And it's hard because... Uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of misinformation out there and and you tie yourself up in knots thinking, well, is is soy better than X, Y, Z? Where does my tofu come from? Is bamboo a solution or am I somehow harming pandas? Um, and it's also tricky because it's easy to feel like we're not listened to by the current political system and people in power. But I was at a, a talk by Catherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist, a while back. And she said, when people go around um, knocking a, on your door and saying, what are your concerns for this area? Um, who are you voting for next? The number one complaint from people is actually potholes. So if we're not telling our government that our number one concern or something that really matters to us is the environment, and not necessarily potholes, which I guess could get worse with the climate crisis, then we're not using our voice well. So I really want to encourage and empower people to think about what they can do well, both in terms of their actions and in terms of their words. So mine's a bit smaller and left of field in that I think we shouldn't be able to export our waste anymore. I think that e-waste should have to stay in the community that generates it. I think all these toxic pollutants should be stuck here. I don't think you should be able to build uh, an air polluting factory somewhere in East Africa or Southeast Asia. If your community wants to benefit from the products of this, I think you should have to be face to face with the consequences in terms of pollution, environmental degradation and the cost to human health. So I think this is some larger international regulation on sort of waste management. But I don't think we should be able to escape it anymore. I think it would help force change if day to day we had to confront the real costs. 
Yeah, I find that sort of thing so interesting um, from the conservation standpoint as well, because we've been talking about the massive impact that environmental damage has been having on places and people already all over the world. But we haven't mentioned species loss. And the rate of species being lost at the moment is truly staggering. Um, Even in the UK, we're losing species at an astonishing rate, not just things like moths and butterflies, but a quarter of our mammal species are, are currently facing extinction. And we don't see that because we live in a nice city and you know, we probably can hear birds singing uh, when we go outside and we just don't recognise that um, that our choices are actually impacting species and biodiversity in really serious ways. And this disconnect between people and nature or between our actions and our consequences is something that I do think is driving some of these problems. What you're really saying is that we have to encounter the challenge of the damage to the environment, each of us. Those of us who just buy something at the co-op, as I do, I, I, you know, I just buy it pre-packaged, right? Um, and occasionally I read something in the newspaper about how one of the retailers are only going to use you know, paper bags. It doesn't touch me. So maybe it's actually physically encountering the damage that we've caused uh, as part of our education, whether it's through online learning and seeing it or whether it's actually visiting, you know, um, the, the, the sewage that we produce. Yeah, I think encountering this is important because if you think about it, even getting in a car and driving somewhere, you know that you're releasing greenhouse gases um, and burning fossil fuels, but you don't see it and you don't see those consequences. And it's almost fair enough. You're using your car to get from A to B. You need it. You're a busy person. You're in a rush. You need to pick the kids up from school. And so that disconnect is a difficult thing. So encountering the damage um, that we do to the environment could be really important. But I also really think that encountering the wonder and the beauty and the hope in nature is something so important. And so not just scaring people and frightening them with the with the information and hoping that that will get them to act, but actually inspiring people and bringing hope is something that is so important too. Uh, I don't know about you, but... Um, I need hope to get out of bed in the morning sometimes. And if I'm feeling particularly frightened, that's just, that's a lot harder. And so, yeah, I think we need to love people well and inspire people too. And and some of that is by showing them the beauty in nature. You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. This week, I'm joined by Steph Bryant, Freya Jeffcott and Beth Bhargava. And we're discussing global warming from scientific, philosophical and religious perspectives. We haven't touched on the religious perspective yet. So I'd like to explore that whole, um, almost the biblical narrative of being stewards of nature rather than masters of nature. Um, Is this something that comes out, I'm looking at you, Steph, in terms of your conversations with the faith communities and the churches and and how they understand uh, our relationship with the environment theologically, if you like. That's a very good question. And I think um, this is why I really want to see religious leaders and people of faith stepping up and taking ownership and working out what we need to do and what we want to do um, to protect the planet. Because if we're called to love, um, so for example, within the Christian faith, we're told to love um, our neighbour as ourselves working out who is our neighbour. Our neighbour are the people who are struggling in countries on the other side of the world. Our neighbour can be the species that we're losing at astonishing rates. And our neighbour can be people of future generations really taking ownership and working out how to love well and how to use what we know to love well is something that we need to see. Because one of the things that worries me when I, I hear that sort of language, and I hear it a lot as a man of faith myself, is that it tends to fall into platitudes. You know, we tend to sort of say, you know, we, we are stewarding the world. That's what we should do. We are children of Adam who came from the earth and, and that sort of thing. And it, it, it lacks substance. And isn't there a real need for our faith community to take real active leadership and, and to be seen, I know that there was some, for example, Extinction Rebellion, and I know that you've got some views about that yourself, Beth. But it was interesting to see some faith leaders actually taking part, leading, getting arrested and everything else. Um, because 
there has to be some sense of leadership. What's your view of Extinction Rebellion, Beth? It's a complicated one because it is genuinely incredible, the numbers that they have mobilised. I mean, what I've always said about it is that it's a movement which lacks diversity and which lacks leadership from the sections of society who are most affected by climate change, so people of colour, working class individuals. And I think for me, that is something that's very much built into the structure of the organisation, the glorification of arrest and arrestability. The idea, I mean, it's it's their guiding goal, um, getting as many bodies on the streets as possible to go into the prisons to overload the state. Can I push you on this? Isn't there a danger that it's relatively straightforward to critique and deconstruct? And it's much harder to actually construct something that will do better. Because one of the, as you said, one of the amazing things about Extinction Rebellion is the generation of number of people across, I, I recognize the middle class element, I get, I get that, but it's still brought out on the street, incredible numbers of people. And I get the critique, but what's the practical alternative? So I think there are positive processes going on in Extinction Rebellion at the moment. What I'd like to see from it beyond kind of reforms in its attitudes to race and the way that's reflected in strategy is a politicisation of the movement. Because I think bodies on the streets are all very well those bodies have to have, you know, they can't they can't just be a physical human mass. They've got to have an idea of what they aspire to construct as well as to deconstruct. So I think I said earlier, um, so they ha- there has to be a vision of the society that we want to build, which is one, I, I, for me, based around communities, based around a genuine democracy that is centred in a political and social community. <laughs> and that's a wonderful vision, a wonderful vision, which sounds like an optimistic vision. And, and I wonder to what extent we are optimistic about the future. I'm going to start with you, Freya, because the way that you've depicted the state of play is almost too late. Oh, I, so I think at its core, I'm really pessimistic. I'm pessimistic because we seem to have put done a lot of damage to this environment that isn't going to disappear, that doesn't dissipate. I mean, all of the herbicides dumped on Vietnam those arsenic-based compounds are still seeping into the water systems. They haven't disappeared for a few decades, sort of, grace. I I think that it depends what kind of hope we're sort of angling for. If there was some large revolution where we go back to sort of a more simple, community-oriented, pastoral sort of way of the world, then that would be phenomenal, but that seems like a huge change. And between here and there, I really see us poisoning ourselves. It's so grim, and I'm not sure if there's a sort of anything scientific to back this up, but I do have this vision of the bacteria you grow in the Petri dish until the Petri dish is exhausted. Mm. And it's not like there's a natural system in there that somehow lets it maintain itself. And I really get panicked by, especially when I meet scientists that have this notion of, we'll innovate out of this. We very much won't, and it's very much a privileged vision. So I worked on the malnutrition crisis with Doctors Without Borders in the Somali region. And I think when you see people starving to death as an actual reality, a way that things can head and end up, it becomes very much a, no, you don't as a human. I'm not sure if this conflicts with some of the religious perspectives too. You're not that special. There's not some brilliant to You're part fix. of the environment. Is yeah, it, there's no escaping it. There's not this great solution that will appear in your time of need. And you mentioned that the technology is is not there for us to repair much of the damage that we've done and, and, and your sense is that it won't be there. So is it a matter of hoping that the world will repair itself um, or um, what can we do other than um, not fill potholes to 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 repair the world. What what technically in, in your your experience? I think if we keep acting as discrete discrete states with all the sort of gaming theory economics that goes on with this, that kind of race, and the being able to export to certain weaker nations, the kind of consequences for a while, I, that has to be addressed. Like first so, it's a foremost. revolutionary in a way, um, uh, paralleling what you said, Beth. It's got to be a fundamental revolution for us to get out of this. And mess. I think it has to be soon. And for that, I think we have to change leadership. And some uh, touching on what you said, I think that this involves a 
big demographic change too in the leadership and who sets the dialogue and the agenda and the vision. Yeah, I mean, just to chip in there too about the the current political system, I think the way that everything is based currently on very short term, uh, getting re-elected kind of goals at the moment, um, I think actually we need to have longer term goals that are much more far-sighted and that span political parties and political borders if we want to shape the future well. So we need to rethink some of how um, politics is done, how we approach it, how politicians are motivated. And we also really need to recognize that we live on a finite resource, that we live on just one planet, and that indefinite economic growth is something that is really just a fairy tale. But in terms of am I optimistic? Well, yes, I think there are a lot of technologies that exist that, um, that if we use, we can make a real difference. So, for example, if you explore Project Drawdown, um, it's a big list of different technological solutions, but also um, all sorts of other things that um, we can think about as humans that would be, they think, the most effective solutions for taking carbon dioxide in from the atmosphere and also reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And what fascinates me when I look at this list is that some of these things are technological, scientific ideas, and some of them are perhaps more individual lifestyle changes like adopting more plant-based diets or reducing food waste. And some of them are about educating girls and women in other countries. And I think it it really interests me that that's a whole combination of different, um, different solutions that different areas and different people can be working on. And I think if we do adopt those uh, ideas that already exist, then we could have a massive positive impact. And the way I see it as a person of faith, I believe that we do each have our particular gifts and passions and things that we're good at. And we really need to step up and work out how to use those things to better the planet. I think stepping up is something that I will be leaving and taking out of this conversation. And so I'm very grateful to each of you for stepping up and coming in and taking part in this Naked Reflections um, discussion. Uh, But unfortunately, you've got to bring it to a close. So my thanks to Steph Bryant, Freya Jeffcott and Beth Bargava. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with any comments, thoughts, feedback or reflections of your own, you can email reflections at nakedscientist.com. In the meantime, You can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientists.com slash reflections. Do join us next time when we'll be talking about inclusivity, and that includes you.